things that drives the, the degree of support amongst the first time voters, 16 and 17 year olds, who for the first time ever will have a vote, sensibly I think, in the referendum. Um, it's that, that sense of a world without borders and barriers and connectivity that's driving that affection amongst the 16 and 17 year olds for a sense of let's stick with what we've got. I don't live my life within a border, my social media life, the, the networks that I'm involved in, I don't see the logic in building a border. And I think the argument those of us who love Scotland have got to make and who want to take that, that affection takes you to a sense of belonging and staying with something um, much bigger is that we can have the best of both worlds. You can have a strong Scottish Parliament inside a United Kingdom, a, a strong Scottish Parliament with ever more powers. Right? There's a Labour Party, understandably you aren't all following the inner workings of the Labour Party Devolution Commission um, and for that to some extent you're fortunate. Uh, <laughs> because it's important but it's intricate work. And the point is that we will be committed to devolving more power <coughs> to the Scottish Parliament. So an even more powerful Scottish Parliament inside the United Kingdom versus the uncertainty of independence. Now, <coughs> what I just offer observations about the campaign thus far as well, in that Stuart and I got on well, Stuart, so we're not going to, we have different, different views, but we're, we both love Scotland as much as one another. We simply come to different conclusions. But when it comes to the sophistry of opinion polling analysis of the opinion polling, and this is still up for grabs, I'm pretty clear that, of course, we're in the lead, um, but it's too early to call the outcome of this referendum. Of course it isn't, and we should just be honest about that. But sometimes when, when the SNP um, announced their delight at when opinion polls that in truth show no movement, um, or actually reversal, they welcomed the, the Maury poll in the last couple of days as continuation of the momentum, even though it showed a two-point fall. Um, some things remind me of the football manager on a struggling football team that says, if only we win all of our games, we might, we might avoid um, uh, this outcome. And I just think a degree of honesty and a degree of transparency about this, I'm pretty open about it. This is still up for grabs. There's a long way to go. There's a huge number of undecided voters and we're determined to work to, pers to persuade them. But I, what I find the least attractive aspect of the debate, apart from all this side, I think a thing that you're genuinely spared and for which you should be genuinely delighted by is uh, you're spared the online assault of a thing called cybernets. Uh, it's a kind of vile... That operates on both sides. It's a <laughs> cybernets <laughs> operate in a kind of vile kind of politics of intimidation. Stuart's not behind that. I know that, absolutely not. Nothing to do with it. You condemn it, I'm absolutely sure. But what I don't like and I don't enjoy is the sense that every time you ask a question, every time someone like me says, well, how would this work? Now, in politics, that's the hardest question. Right? You see Jeremy Paxman on the telly and all the other things. The hardest question to ask a politician is, how would that work? Now, Mandy, you're probably going to ask us right now. That told you. you already know that. You're yeah. out of time. I am. We're going to finish <laughs> with this. Is it? But whatever you ask, you're being negative. So to tell the truth, which is it wouldn't be in Scotland's interest to have a common currency with a foreign country um, under the way it's been envisaged by the SNP, is talking Scotland down. To question how you would automatically and uniquely get access to being a new member of the European Union, it's talking Scotland down. And somehow it's a sense of it's unpatriotic, it's unScottish to ask those sorts of questions. The truth is, Scotland became the country that it was. She became such a magnificent kind of icon to intellectual innovation across the world through the Enlightenment and through the, the Reformation because we always ask why. How did Scotland invent <coughs> so many things? How did we become world leaders in so many different ways? Because we've always asked and we Ill, will always ask why. It's the patriotic thing to do. It's the right thing to do. And the burden of proof lies with those who want to break up what I think is arguably the most successful social union the world has ever known. And as yet, they have been unable to answer the question, why, how would that work? Thank you very much.
the um, activity that goes online, and no doubt we'll talk about that afterwards, but that comes from all sides, and perhaps on the European issue in particular, that has created a lot of heat and not very much light. And perhaps Andrew will be able to make some of that a little, a little clearer for us. Thank you. Uh, I hope I can make some things a little clearer. I'd like to make some observations from a, a UK perspective and from a constitutional and historical perspective about, about these whole I issues. We've heard some of the arguments for and against. I'm going to try and take a step, a step back a bit. A lot of them involve the legitimacy of the referendum. By this I mean how far will its result be accepted as fair and decisive. In answering these questions, it's important to accept that there are more than two simple results from this referendum. It's not just about a yes or a no. We've got to factor in the precise percentage that the winning and losing side might get in this referendum, and also the turnout. We've heard earlier about a, a possible 80% turnout. Well, that, that would be very impressive, but that's, that's an important factor to, to, to consider how high the turnout is. If we look at the yes or no vote, there are, there are many kinds of permutations on what a yes or no vote might be. For instance, a narrow no vote, although of course the point at which narrow turns into not narrow and becomes comfortable is, all, is, uh, <laughs> is always going to be open to question anyway, but a narrow no vote shouldn't be interpreted as an unmitigated triumph for the union and it would surely encourage the independence movement to try again at an appropriate point. Obviously, these people don't want to hear about this right now, but uh, this is what I think are our longer term issues we have to consider. <laughs> a narrow yes would, I suppose, be a victory. It would have to be acted on. And in this sense, the yes campaign has an inbuilt long-term advantage because they only have to win once. And reversing independence is a uh, probably even longer term proposition than uh, having another referendum if there's been a no vote first time around. So, so that's something to bear in mind that, well, for both sides, for, pe for people voting in Scotland, is if they are going to vote yes, that's much more of an irreversible decision than, than voting no. Even if, if a yes vote is achieved and it's, and it's on a narrow majority, although that will mean it happens, presumably, it is actually quite a challenging basis on which to try and create a new or recreate an old state, depending on which way you want to have it. It's a challenging basis for whoever's given the job of then constructing this state. And we heard about the, the constitutional platform and the, and the plans there. Then we move on to turnout. Even a more decisive verdict, one way or the other, will be less impressive if the winning side does not, for instance, manage to command an absolute majority of those who are able to vote. Indeed, there's some difficult questions to be answered here. Does the overall contest have more legitimacy, and therefore the result have more legitimacy, if turnout is high, even if the vote is close, or is it better to have a decisive in outcome on a lower turnout? These are questions I think they're difficult to answer, but we have to see that there's a lot more subtlety in here than we might, that might first appear to be the case. And there's also other factors to be considered, for instance, regional variations. If different parts of Scotland vote different ways, and I understand there's going to be counting in 32 local authorities areas. Uh, will, will this be regarded as a problem if some areas have voted a different way to the actual result? I don't know. So this leads on to uh, my second point, and this is about what historical observations can be made here. Even if we get a high turnout and a large majority one way or the other, and most or all areas vote the same way, how much faith should we be placing in a referendum as a way of actually settling this issue? 
I think the best evidence, it's not perfect, but the best evidence we've got from UK history is the 1975 <coughs> referendum on whether or not we should continue to be members of the European Economic Community. On paper, you could say that looked like a decisive result. About 67% voted yes, staying in the EEC, and the turnout was about 65% which is slightly lower than general elections as turnouts tended to be then, but higher than we get now. So it's a pretty decent turnout and a pretty big yes majority. And nearly every part of the country voted yes, except uh, Shetland and the Western Isles, in fact. So in theory, that looks like a decisive vote. Yet by the early 1980s, the Labour Party, which in government had called the referendum, had split over the issue, and this partly led to the formation of the Social Democratic Party, and Labour entered the 1983 general election on a manifesto pledge to withdraw with, from the EEC without even holding a referendum on it. They, the manifesto said something along the lines of, if we were elected, we'll begin negotiation to leave. So it obviously hadn't settled that, the issue at all, and, and we can hardly claim that the issue of UK membership of what is now the European Union is, has become any more settled since. And the, the Conservatives are now seriously split over the issue, with a cleavage between some of the leadership on the one hand who seem in essence to want to stay in in some form or other, and many backbenchers and activists on the other hand who are inclined to force an exit from the EU. And we've also got, a, as we know, a party who are ostensibly dedicated to leaving the EU amongst other issues, the U UK Independence Party. So did the 1975 referendum work? Well, on that evidence, not really. And this, this leads on to another point, I think, involving the legitimacy of referendums and whether they can actually work as a way of taking these kind of decisions. And that's, even if you're apparently decisively defeated, you can then, if you've got the result you didn't want, start looking at the campaign and the way the whole thing was held and start finding problems with that. And certainly the Eurosceptics in the UK talk about the 1975 referendum, the media were biased, it was the wrong kind of uh, issues being played up in the media at the time, people didn't really know what they were getting into, the EU has gone on and changed in ways that we couldn't have expected in 1975, all that kind of stuff, whether you accept it or not. It offers some opportunities to, uh, of examples that the losing side in this referendum might want to pursue in future. And to give an example, the, uh, the Yes campaign, if they lose, could argue that uh, Scotland were told they could make a free choice to determine their own future in a referendum, but then during the campaign, the three main parties at UK level did everything they possibly could to threaten Scottish voters with disastrous outcomes and that they wouldn't cooperate over things like a sterling union if Scottish voters exercised their free choice in what they saw as being the wrong way. Now, I'm not endorsing that argument, and I hope I, I won't be quoted by, uh, by anybody as endorsing that argument, but it's the kind of uh, argument that could be put forward by the losing side if, if the losing side is the... Uh, is the losing side that opinion polling at the moment points towards. So, you know, again, it's always possible to challenge the legitimacy of a referendum. They're not a magic bullet as a device of political decision making. This leads on to another point. The issue of European Union, again, leads me on to, on to my penultimate point. During the campaign for the referendum that's going on at the moment, we're encountering quite an interesting version of what the European Union is. We're told the European Union is a wonderful organisation, no one would ever want to leave it, and uh, nobody, and if Scotland vote to become independent, they might not be able to immediately join and there might be various obstacles to their joining. And uh, the other side of the of the, uh, of the of the case, the pro-independence, argue, of course we want to be in the European Union and we'll be able to be in the European Union. So both sides of the debate are presenting the European Union 
in a very positive light as something that whatever else happens, you want to be inside this organisation. Now this is quite a different European Union to the one <laughs> I often hear about in, in UK public discourse that we're told that, that it's a monstrosity, an undemocratic, interfering, regulating organisation and perhaps if it doesn't change in accordance with the precise preferences of the UK, we actually might think about leaving it. So I think this is, a, this is a point not just for Scotland but for the whole of the UK that we should maybe think again about the European Union if it's possible to view it in this positive light. What are we actually getting ourselves into with this renegotiation idea and a referendum possibly ending in us leaving the European Union or whatever else other, other Eurosceptics may have planned for us in the European Union and actually there are some quite positive lines coming out for the European Union and I would also question from, from the Unionist perspective, particularly the Conservative and Unionist Party and the, the, the approach many of within that party take towards the European Union is that if we are actually going to be renegotiating and on the strength of what uh, uh, Mrs Merkel, the German Chancellor said recently there's not a lot on offer there. If we are actually thinking about that and then holding a referendum and possibly leaving, how does Scotland remain within the European Union? It would seem the path to follow there is to become independent and seek membership having become independent rather than staying within, it, within a UK which might actually leave. And that does tend to undermine the whole argument that staying within the UK is the only way to stay within the EU. So, you know, they, again, there are some interesting point, debating points there, perhaps. So, finally, and some of this has cropped up already, again, it's an issue for the whole UK constitution. But whatever happens, whether Scotland votes yes or no, you've got to understand what's going on here is part of a much wider process of constitutional flux that the UK has been passing through since at least the 1960s, that, in my opinion, involves a country that used to be an empire not being an empire any longer and having trouble coming to terms with this fact and going through all kinds of processes of self-examination, self-doubt, reform, change, some of it very good in my opinion, some of it not so good, to try and deal with this issue. And, this, and what's going on in Scotland is a part of, that, of a much wider process that's been going on that affects the whole of, whole of the UK and it's going to carry on happening. And if, obviously, if Scotland became independent, that would be a big deal for the UK. But we might try and pretend that nothing had happened, as was the case when, uh, when part of Ireland left the UK. There was a general attempt to explain it all the way as a localised issue. Actually, it will be a big deal because it, it will impact upon the relationship between the remaining parts of the UK and how they deal with each other. And certainly, uh, Welsh First Minister, Colwyn Jones, has been very keen to link this issue to the UK as a whole and is talking about the need for a constitutional convention, possibly a written constitution to try and deal with some of these issues. So if, if Scotland goes, clearly that's a big deal not only for Scotland but for the UK. But if Scotland stays, well, what happens then? 2016, the Scottish Parliament has already got extra powers, significant powers due to come to it, fiscal powers, which will affect the whole dynamics of politics in Scotland and issues around the raising and spending of money that haven't yet been fully confronted because the powers weren't really there. We don't know what's going to happen with that, but we know it's going to be important. And that will also have knock-on effects for the rest of the UK, funding formula for the UK. The, the English issue, which, which is, is, is still going to be around, the West Lothian question is still going to be there. All of those issues will still need to be addressed if Scotland remains. They'll, they'll need to be addressed even more urgently if Scotland remains. So that issue's not going to go away. We've heard the Labour Party are discussing even the possibility of even more devolution to go on top of the extra devolution that's coming in 2016. So all, all of those things are going to happen. And I suspect where we could end up at the end of it all, in line with some of what Carwin Jones and other people have been saying, is some kind of written constitution for the UK. Scotland, as I understand it, will be moving towards a written constitution if they become independent. That seems like a logical step. Or perhaps the UK as a whole, with or without Scotland, will need to move to a written, to a written constitution of some kind. And I suspect if there was one, it would be a clearly federal system, which is actually, interestingly, what 
a lot of people in Scotland actually wanted in 1706, 1707, at the time that the union was first negotiated, but the theoretical grounding <laughs> wasn't there. So we might get to, to what was desired in the first place. Thank you. Questions for us all there. Um, perhaps not all being quoted by Alexander. <laughs> um, but that leads us nicely into Sue, who likes to talk about the what ifs. Oh. Uh, is that okay? I will have to say I always feel very conflicted about this uh, issue of Scottish independence. Because the last time the Scots tried to escape the English yoke, my ancestors were players. The Camerons were the first to greet Bonnie Prince Charlie, and the clan chief, who I think was the gentle Lochiel, advised the prince, go home. To which the prince said, I am home. And the chief, instead of saying what he should have said, which is, no, 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 Sonny, on your boat, he said, heroically, honorably, but very foolishly, we will support you. And so there were, I think, 700 Camerons who rallied to his banner with their war cry, our war cry, sons of the hounds, come here and get flesh. But although I was born and brought up in England, I understand sort of the emotional appeal of Scotland uh, wanting to set up on its own, but I fervently hope that it will remain within the Union. So if I could just talk briefly, I think they will decide to remain in the Union, although as we've heard very persuasively, uh, nothing can be taken for granted. But what if, just briefly, what if they do decide, Scotland does decide, to become independent? Well, first of all, there will be absolute chaos, I think, in Whitehall, which is what I quite often write about. Practically every department's going to be affected. The whole system will go into overdrive. And I bet you anything you like that the bartering and the negotiations will take an awful lot longer than anybody expected. If Scotland does vote for independence, Whitehall and Westminster, are, and I take the, uh, the point that Andrews just made, but I think Whitehall and Westminster certainly will accept the result. Um, and every effort will be made to ensure that the separation is as amicable as possible. I know that uh, Andy mentioned the civil service. It's been a little bit, um, a little bit uh, torn because Sir Peter Housden, the chief civil servant in Scotland, has clearly been on the side of his Scottish first minister. And when he comes down for Wednesday morning meetings with the other top civil servants uh, in Whitehall, if they're going to discuss Scotland or anything that could affect Scotland, he's not invited to the meetings. We now have sort of to even the thing up. Sir Nicholas McPherson, the uh, chief civil servant at the Treasury, giving a view in accordance with his minister, George Osborne, the chancellor, about the pound. There was actually a, a complaint, I think it was over uh, Peter Housden. Somebody uh, uh, complained to the then cabinet secretary, Sir Gus O'Donnell, now Lord O'Donnell, and said he shouldn't be taking sides. He's meant to be an impartial civil servant. And Gus pointed out, I think quite properly, that civil servants are ultimately servants of their ministers. If they want to press uh, the case being put by their minister, then they're quite entitled to do it. But I don't think that that will uh, last if, there is, uh, if, if Scotland does vote to peel off. The only thing that might just come up in the negotiations is that I think there's 9,000 civil servants in Scotland. I think their pensions all come out of a UK-wide pot. So whether that could form part of any negotiations, I don't know. But it's not going to be in anybody's interest, it seems to me, for England and Scotland to be uh, at each other's throats. And if Scotland votes to go it alone, then I think all sorts of people will start coming out of the woodwork, people who have uh, passionately um, urged the unionist cause, but I think you will get civil servants, business people, diplomats, bankers, who will do everything they can to uh, smooth the path 
and to minimize the impact of separation. Uh, people who will try to perhaps mend fences with Europe, with the Bank of England, with anybody else that can help to make the thing work. When Tony Blair won the uh, election, the UK election in 1997, <clears throat> he was, after he'd been clapped into number 10, he was left alone in the uh, cabinet room with the then cabinet secretary, Sir Robin Butler, Lord Butler now, and uh, Robin Butler said to him, well done, what now? To which Blair says in his book, I found that question strangely disturbing. I suspect that if Alex Salmon wins, he's going to feel much the same once he's actually uh, won it. But what if the Scots vote no? And I think that this is much more likely, even though I take the point that nobody can be complacent, something amazing could happen, but it has been pretty consistent. And I think we heard from Mark that there's never been a majority for independence. Um, but uh, supposing that they decide no, I think in a way that could be much more interesting, uh, far more painful, and far more of an upheaval for the UK as a whole. I think we saw in those slides that only 17% uh, of people polled in England and Wales um, they, uh, who felt that the referendum was really going to be important for them. I think it's going to have a huge impact on England and Wales, indeed on all of us. If you look at the politics first, if the Scots leave, it's all quite straightforward as far as Westminster goes, because Westminster lose, loses 59 Scottish MPs, of whom I think 40 or 41 uh, at present are Labour. So if Ed Miliband wins the 2015 UK uh, general election with a Westminster majority that depends on Scottish MPs, he will cease to be Prime Minister when they all leave in perhaps May 2016. <laughs> I tell you something, a yes vote won't half add a bit of spice to the 2015 general election. <laughs> and remember in 2010, had there been no Scottish MPs at Westminster, the Tories would have won outright. Uh, what about the impact uh, if uh, uh, the Scots uh, do go, by the way, on David Cameron? I mean, um, Mary Tudor lost France. She said she'd have Calais engraved on her heart. George III lost America. But for Prime Minister Cameron to lose Scotland, I think that would have a huge impact on his chances in the 2015 election as well. But if the Scots vote uh, to stay, then, um, as Andrew suggested, the whole sorry question of Scottish representation at Westminster is finally going to have to be addressed instead of fudged. Scots MPs who have no say whatever on uh, Scottish domestic affairs, because it's done by the Parliament in Edinburgh, but who can vote on English issues. It is the West Lothian question. Then there's the question of over-representation. Uh, what's going to happen about that? Because if you look at the numbers of voters per constituency, Scotland's overrepresented. If you're Prime Minister Miliband, do you say, well, we'll just cut the numbers from <coughs> by about 11 or 10 or 11 and hope that that'll be enough to buy off the Tories? Or do you say, right, we're the Tories, we're going to try and cut 20 and hugely reduce the number? And do you say, and or, that in any case, no Scottish MPs may now vote on purely English domestic matters? If so, and again, we heard mention of a federal system, but if so, how on earth do you cope with this huge asymmetry of a UK where uh, overseas defense, foreign affairs, welfare, though that could change, um, are all done by perhaps Prime Minister Miliband, and where other things that the English care about, education um, and health, uh, the f which matters in by far the biggest part of the UK, England, 
are done by somebody else. Do we have a pinky and perky system at Prime Minister's Questions? How on earth does it work? And I think it is worth noting that in most other federal systems, you have everybody has their own parliament and then you have a federal one. But I don't think there are other countries that certainly, I can't think of any, where you have such a huge imbalance. And that is going to have to be addressed. It's always been fudged um, up to now. Um, and, of course, the major political parties have all been extremely reticent about telling us what their plans are to deal with this issue. You bet they are. And I expect that they're all going to stay stum until well after the referendum. Because if they say they're going to reduce the powers and numbers of Scottish MPs at Westminster, that's bound to upset some Scots. If they don't, they're going to upset the English. Up to now, the English haven't been too bothered. Um, they've uh, almost reacted, well, if the Scots vote differently, if the Scots tend to vote Labour, there's only one Tory MP, I think, at present in Scotland. Well, you know, in Northern England, they tend to vote Labour. In the South East, they tend to vote Tory. Um, it's not something we should get too upset about. But I think that the referendum, uh, whatever the result, but I think that could change all that, even if the Scots don't vote for independence. Um, all the political parties agree that Scotland must have more devolved powers. Some are already allowed for, I think, uh, income tax in the Scotland Act. Uh, that's going to make the English much more aware of the potential democratic deficit um, if England votes Tory and Scotland votes Labour. And people south of the border are going to be, I think, less and less likely to put up with um, the prospect of the Scots foisting some policies and perhaps even a prime minister on them when they haven't voted for them. That will be underlined by the changes that will surely have to be made again at long last in the Barnet formula for allocating uh, money. Scotland, um, uh, the, the Barnet formula, Lord Barnet himself, who is in his 90s, uh, but I think is still with us, uh, and he's been saying for years that the Barnett formula, his formula, is no longer applicable and really uh, needs to be scrapped. Um, and I think that after the referendum, again, almost regardless of the result, but um, the opportunity will at last have to be taken to adjust it. And the English, um, they're going to demand nothing less. Treasury figures, and I don't intend to get involved in too much arguing about figures because there are obviously people who, here who know much better than me, but Treasury figures suggest that average public spending uh, per head in England in 2012 was about £1,600 less than in Scotland. And once this whole thing goes up into the air, the English, and perhaps particularly some of those in the poorer parts of England, are going to wake up to that and they are not going to be happy about it. So what the referendum is going to do, in my view, it's going to act as a political and constitutional catalyst, just as much if the Scots stay, um, in fact more so, if anything, than if they leave. Um, and I think there could be a whole lot of other questions thrown up. Will there be more demand for greater devolution for the major English cities outside London? Uh, will the separatists ever give up, as Andrew said, particularly if they lose only narrowly? Uh, the referendum is said to be a once-in-a-generation event. Well, next year sees the 300th anniversary of the first Jacobite rebellion, which was followed only 30 years later, you know, generations don't last that long, by the second one. So we could have to go through the whole thing all over again in 2045. Whatever the outcome, I believe that the referendum, far from uh, settling everything, is likely to start a chain reaction, the results of which we can only guess at.
we open up the question, I was just going to say I absolutely agree with Sue. I think this is a chain reaction, and I think this is why it absolutely matters to you. Where I would disagree with Sue is that while there's never been a majority for yes, there has absolutely been a majority for change. And I think it's incumbent on the no side to start presenting those plans ahead of the, the um, referendum because if they're going to start to promise more powers to Scotland, they probably have to start writing their manifestos for 2015 for Scots to believe that those changes will happen. I then think what Sue said is correct, that down south and everywhere else will start to say, well, wait a minute, maybe we want more powers too. So, can we open up for questions? Anyone? Yes. Sorry, just wait for the mic. Sorry, my name is Tisha Kessler. I'm a Dutch journalist. I have a question for um, Mark Diffley. Um, your slide showed very much what the English and the Welsh think of Scottish independence. What about the Northern Irish? Uh, it's a good question. We didn't include them in this particular uh, piece of um, piece of research. I don't think there's anything to well. Perhaps uh, others would like to kind of explore it. I mean, we, we, uh, we don't know. Clearly, the, the, the issue of um, independence has a particular kind of meaning in Ireland that it doesn't have uh, in, this particular, in this particular debate. Um, and I know that they are very closely watching the, you know, the, the, the government there is very closely watching uh, the outcome of this and what it means to, to the issues uh, that they face themselves. But as far as this research was concerned, we, we, we don't have the views of people from Northern Ireland. Any more questions? Can I take the opportunity to... Oh, yes? Hi, uh, my name's Simon Fitzpatrick. Um, my question is actually also aimed at Mark, although I could sort of ask a supplementary to the other um, panellists as well, but it was about the undecided voters. Um, and 10% or 12% in the Epsos poll is, is quite low compared to other polls. Um, so I was just curious as to what the, if you have any views on what the discrepancy is there, what methodology is that results in, in lower numbers of undecided. And I guess as a supplementary to, to Jim and Stuart is, uh, what are the sort of plans or strategy for, for targeting the undecided voters in the, the last six months? Yeah, if I just go first quickly then on the, on the numbers, the, the, the key thing here is about how you ask the question. We ask, how would you vote if the referendum was held now? Whereas some other organisations ask, how, ask respondents to say how they predict they will vote on September the 18th, thus enhancing the number of don't knows that they pick up. Uh, we kind of counter for that in the follow-up question which I put up on the slides there. So everyone who gives us a yes or no opinion, we ask them, you know, are you certain about that or may you change your mind? And in fact, when we add that proportion, we get to uh, around the same sort of about 25% or so, which is roughly, a, you know, give or take what, uh, what other organisations find who ask the question in a slightly different way. I think we've got two more questions. So, oh, more? <laughs> Nick Bosengett from uh, Imperial College and also consultant director of Reform. I think the most important message that's come to me out of this, uh, this very useful meeting is that the, the No campaign has surely got to present a more positive vision of what's going to happen after, uh, <coughs> to after, after September. And I would ask Jim and uh, perhaps anybody else on the panel, and, and uh, also our, our friend uh, from Dundee, if there is a no vote, what contribution are you going to make to revitalizing the union? Uh, you're not just going to sit there and wait for another referendum in 30 years' time. That didn't work in Quebec, by the way. <laughs> And I don't think it would work in Scotland. So are you really going to come, come on board and help to revitalise the union, to deliver the kind of goals which I think we all agree with in, in much of what you said about the economy? Jim, do you want to address negativity? Um, on, on, for a couple of sentences on both numbers, 
I'll try and answer, my, answer the questions in an observational way rather than a kind of partisan um, punch someone in the chin or whatever type of way, um, as Mandy asked us to. We'll do the opposite. Simon's point about the undecideds, I think a lot, I think the polling suggests, and Stuart may, may or may not disagree with this, but this, the polling suggests a lot of these folk um, just want to know what does it mean for me? Um, and they're not taking a, they're not, a lot of them are not taking a big values based thing or a big um, national identity based thing. It's what would this mean? So I suspect that, that that's what our poll show, and I suspect it's partly what Stuart's poll and certainly what the Mori poll shows. And I suspect that's why when the SNP um, launched their big white paper plan um, about independence, a big part of that was childcare. Um, because arguably they wouldn't need more constitutional powers to do that, but nevertheless, that was the centrepiece. So I think, I think the polling on all sides suggests that an awful lot of undecided voters just want to know what does it mean for me and my family? And I think the prize is whichever side whichever side of this debate is able to um, make the most convincing argument about that. Making the convincing argument for that is for another night. I mean, um, on the next point about um, the more positive case, I think you're right, which is why I said at the beginning, Nick, is that um, you've got to not just win a vote, you've got to win an argument about what the country is going to be like in the future. And one of the things that um, I'm very keen on, and we'll see where the, the Labour Party Policy Commission um, goes to is about devolving aspects of the welfare state. Because the Scottish Parliament, as many of you all know, um, uh, already has tax powers. And as Andrew, Andrew mentioned in his comments, it's about to get more tax powers. But it's a relatively dormant power. And again, I'm not making a judgment in that, and I'm not making involved in the argument in it. It's just it's a power that hasn't been used. Now, it's an important part of any mature parliament to have tax powers, which is what it currently has. Now, welfare, however, is an every day of the week type of power. It affects so many people um, in all sorts of different ways. And if Scotland was to have aspects of the welfare state devolved to it, and we'll make an announcement about that, um, then I think that's a, a living, breathing, every day of the week type power that could make a real, a real difference. But it's not for me this evening um, to announce it. That's for the Scottish Labour Party leader, Joanne Lamont, to go through and announce any details that we might be doing on that. But I think instinctively I feel devolving aspects of the welfare state. We have to have a unit, there's aspects which should make sense to be unitary, and there's aspects that may make sense um, to devolve. I certainly can tell you once we've announced it, yes. <laughs> uh, Just instinctively, what instinct, instinctively, I think my party leader should announce that when she's ready. <laughs> when she's ready. But uh, look, we're going through a really thorough process. But Nick, once we've announced this, I th I'm absolutely certain you'll be clear that certainly the Scottish Labour Party, and it's for the other two pro-devolution parties to make their own case, will have a pretty clear sense of how Scotland can have more power and use that power to have less poverty. The um, questions are quite interesting. Um, the answer about the don't knows is actually the key one. Uh, and it is about making a pitch. And I suppose for us it's about demonstrating why we need independence to do many of the things which I think would generally be expect, accepted would be good things. And that will continue. The grassroots campaign, which is huge, will continue. And I think that's the main driver in terms of how we reach this million people who are yet to probably make their mind up. Now, I'm going to do something quite unusual. I'm actually going to agree with Jim Murphy uh, when he described the tax powers of the Scottish Parliament as effectively dormant. It's 15% or so of taxes that are able to be collected in Scotland. Now, that's useful, one might say. The problem is that a chunk of that, a significant chunk, is income tax and some other small uh, levies. But it's a narrow basket. So even though we get more income tax, for example, it would be impossible, in a sense, to cut income tax to grow the economy if the reward for that was higher corporation tax that went to the London Exchequer that we couldn't reinvest in society. So there's got to be a basket of taxes, a broad basket of taxes, not just lots of one tax and a couple of small levies. And you know, I hope what the Labour Party finally announced will be ambitious. I genuinely hope it will be. But I suspect it won't be. And I suspect it won't even go as far as Reform Scotland's plan, which, remember, was a 60-40 split. 60% of all taxes in Scotland collected in Scotland 
to mirror the 60% of spending that takes place in Scotland in and on behalf of the people there. So uh, I hope it's ambitious. I hope it's a broad uh, basket. But the Labour Party have already voted against many taxes being devolved. They've already spoken out against corporation tax. So we'll just have to wait and see. But I'm not holding my breath. Well, the real question, <laughs> the real question though, about devolution, devil max, <laughs> devil plus, people who want more powers, more powers isn't on the ballot paper because the unionist parties couldn't agree a package. So the question I think you need to ask yourself is, if you want more powers, do you vote for everything with independence or do you vote for nothing, which may well be an offer, particularly the Conservatives, win the next election? No, there were two, no, there were two more questions. I've put my glasses on so I can see people now. A chat down here as well once. And was there somebody else up here? I'll remember you, Red Hi, this is a question for Stuart Hosey. Uh, you had indicated that the SNP seeks to grow uh, the number of jobs in Scotland quite significantly, but uh, given that there's an ageing population within the country and also a housing crisis, where are these people going to come from and where are they going to live? Well, in any growing economy, the demand for houses partly gets met from the private sector and partly gets met from the public sector and the social housing sector, as it should do. And you'll be aware from the question, I know you'll be aware that we are trying to build more social houses in Scotland. You'll also be aware because of the huge financial crisis we've all been in, the private housing sector has been extremely flat indeed for some years. There is still unemployment in Scotland, not as high as in the rest of the UK, but that's not to say a huge amount. There are people who can fill jobs if they're properly trained. If we bring new people through, they can fill these jobs. Many of these positions are medium and long-term uh, uh, um, uh, positions because it's about growing the export capacity. It's about the benefits of reduction in corporation tax. It's the benefits in terms of a growing economy from targeted tax breaks. So it doesn't happen overnight. And as I laid out in the speech, you also tackle some of that as you tackle the demographic challenge by providing the opportunity so that Scots don't have to leave, so that some who've left can come home, so that people who come to Scotland can study, and there are many, many tens of thousands, are able to actually stay and contribute, and you bring in the skilled workforce you need. But of course, right now, immigration policy in particular is a reserve matter, and we can't do many of the things we'd like to do in that regard. Can, can you Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, I don't know whether... I've, Stuart, I don't know if you were able to say what the, the population target would be in an, your sense of what that target would be in an independent Scotland, because obviously you would have to pay for pensions and, and that sort of stuff. Do you, have a, do, you, uh, do you guys have a number? Well, at the moment we're, see, we're forecasting a 9% rise to 2037. I think the figure in the UK is 29% rise, which is a, a substantially larger number. Now, the issue about the costs of people coming in we certainly have some evidence at the Treasury Select Committee recently about this, that people tend to come in post-education ready to work, so the cost of that investment isn't there. And many actually return before they reach pensionable age, so you get the benefits of their education without the costs at either side. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but I'm sure mm -hmm. that was evidence. So all in all, in economic terms, I don't have a target, you know, a six million or 10 million target, but all in all, in economic terms, it makes sense to do that to tackle the demographic challenge which the IFS said is faced in common with every country in Western Europe. And I suppose the question for you, Jim, would be why should Scotland uniquely not have the tools to tackle that challenge in the way every other country does? Like Wales? Um, well, Wales which, is a country, which, is a, which is a country, and it doesn't have its own immigration policy. Um, now, just on the, the points that which well, every other country, yeah, you said we just name any other country. There's one, um, but on the Stuart earlier spoke about um, he hopes the the powers that we recommend through the Labour Party will be sufficient. They, they, look for Stuart, not Stuart, for the SNP, they just won't be, right? And there's no point in any member of the SNP holding their breath um, because look, there's nothing the Scottish Labour Party or any other pro devolution party can advocate other than full independence that would make them breathe easily. Um, because regardless of what the problem is, and this is what, there are, there are a few reasons why I'm not a nationalist. One is, my, I 
kind of I have a politics. This is my own view, right? It's not I'm not in any way trying to caricature anyone else. Just my my own my own view is that you can have much more in common with people like me in Liverpool, um, London or Manchester than I have with people who are nothing like me in Scotland. In terms of growing up in a working class housing scheme in Glasgow, I, my politics are I just instinctively feel more comfortable um, about not building borders. That old sense of, that kind of old labour and trade union sense of unity is strength and you're more powerful sticking together. And there's a similar approach, I think, in that unity is strength argument in the United Kingdom. Um, the four of us together are stronger than we, than we would be weaker apart. But so when you hear, you folks will probably, have, you're, all, you're interested in this by virtue of being here. And you'll maybe see some of this happen in the media over the next few weeks. But look, when Atlee's government was building homes fit for heroes, the SNP wanted independence for Scotland. Right? When we were introducing the national minimum wage, the SNP wanted independence for Scotland. When we were creating devolution, the SNP wanted independence for Scotland. It's a one answer catches all, regardless of the circumstances, right, regardless of the date. So there is nothing that the pro devolution parties can do to placate the one. Pro one mainstream pro-independence party. There's just a difference. Devolution and independence are opposites. Independence isn't an end point of devolution. Independence is about leaving altogether. Devolution is about getting the right balance within the United Kingdom. So when you watch this on the news, if you, if you, or you read in the papers and this comes up about how the SNP said it's not good enough, it's never going to be good enough. It never has been. And for the SNP, it never would be. That's just that's just their view of the world, and I'm not I'm, I'm not deliberately trying to jibe anyone. It's just the way. It, for those of you who haven't watched the detail of the debate over the years in Scotland, that's just the layout of it. And I wouldn't want people to come away with the conclusion that actually what I'm arguing for is a, a tamer version of what Stuart's arguing for. We're both patriots. We both love our country, but just think very different things and opposite things I in terms of the Constitution. I know Stuart's desperate yeah. to come in, but I just wanted to mm -hmm. ask um, just on that. When you're talking about that, Jim, mm -hmm. how, instinctively, how do you feel then that people who live in the more deprived areas of Scotland, areas where like my family. traditionally may have voted Labour, are actually much more pro-independence than in other areas? Uh, What's again? happened to the Labour well, Party that that's become about? I don't think it's a statement of the Labour Party. It's a statement about the complexity and scale of this issue in that people who vote SNP, I think it's, and again, this is, Maury will have the figures, but I think about one in three people who voted SNP at the last Scottish election are going to vote to stay in the UK. Mm -hmm. So this breaks all different, all sorts of different ways. Um, it's one of the interesting things about it. But instinctively, people who have less financial capital. Um, people who, like all the friends I grew a lot of the friends that I grew up with, um, you've, got to, you've got to make an argument, and we will make an argument, I'm pretty confident we will, a convincing argument that says you can be better off. You can be better off. Your life can be better. And you don't have to leave Britain. You just have to change Britain. And one of the, I think one of the convincing arguments about this would be I'll, I'll, there's a big argument, I'll give you a much abridged version of it. Entirely understandably, the SNP want to change the question. Right? And that's the case, you talked about the, the nature of referendums, Andrew, about being different. People often answer a different question to what's actually on the ballot paper when it comes to a referendum. It's just part of, the, it's part of the thing. And the SNP, for understandable tactical reasons, want to turn it into um, independence versus the Tories. Right, because only one Tory MP in Scot only one Tory MP in Scotland, but that's not the choice. Like, independence. The, the referendum will be decided um, this year. Scotland can help get rid of David Cameron next year. Any government is temporary. Of course, David Cameron's unpopular in Scotland. Every pri Tory Prime Minister, at least in the last three decades, has been unpopular in Scotland. But he's temporary. Independence is permanent. And I think for a lot of these people who are furious, I mean, have a daily fury about some of the policies um, over the past um, Tory governments, um, there's, a con there's a convincing argument that we've got to make to them. Um, vote to give Scotland more powers within the UK this year 
and vote to have no Tories in Downing Street next year. And I think that's a compelling argument for a lot of those people. Stuart. Um, when Jim spoke um, about borders, I thought that was intriguing. Because it's only unionists who ever talk about borders. We want borders. Scottish independence. We never talk about borders. We want the common trade area to continue. We want to be able to trade freely. We want our people, everyone, to be able to travel freely as they currently do. So it's not those who want independence. It's unionists and British nationalists who talk about borders. And it's part of what they call themselves Project Fear. It's only scaremongering. No, no, now, when no, Jim's, no. Jim, please, I didn't interrupt you, please. When Jim, when Jim talks about his background, I, I sympathise with that. I genuinely do. Because I was born in a tenement in Baffin Street. And you could hear the hooter from the Caledon shipyard, about 500 yards towards the river. So the backgrounds aren't dreadfully different. And I'm sure the aspirations we want for the people we serve aren't dreadfully different either. But I do reject Jim's assertion that only if you're a member of the Labour Party you can share values of solidarity. I share exactly the same values of solidarity, I suspect, with exactly the same people Jim would. I just don't want to share a Tory Prime Minister with them in order to demonstrate that I've got those values of solidarity. And the thing about Jim's argument, as much as I respect it, we might get a change in government now and again. We might even get the government the Scottish people elect now and again. But what does that really mean? It means that 18 years of Thatcher and Major, 18 years of Tory government, 18 years while we watched entire industries dismantled before our eyes, was a price worth paying for Tony Blair and an illegal war in Iraq. I'm sorry, but I don't buy that. I'd rather the Scottish people, the Scottish nation, simply got the government it elected. We took our own political decisions and we maintained properly the free trade, the free travel and the social union that exists between us all, quite rightly. Yep, I'm going to ask people for credit. So, chap in the blue here and chap in the red. Hello. Um, I would like a bit more clarity on the membership of the European Union. So, if I understand correctly, if Scotland has to join the EU, then you'll be obliged to, to well, under Lis the Lisbon Treaty, you'll have to join the Euro and also be obliged to join Schengen. Um, is that the case? And if you say, no, we'll keep the pound and we won't, we'll stay out of the Schengen, that means you have to negotiate that position. And is what Scotland's negotiating position, if they go to the EU where there's plenty of member states like Spain and France have their own independent problems and how does, that all, how does that play out and what does that look like? I'll give you the very brief answer because I'm conscious time is short. We won't have to join the Euro because to do so would require us to be in the exchange rate mechanism for two years. Joining ERM2 is voluntary. We've no intention of volunteering Scotland to do that. Schengen's quite interesting. We have a CTA common travel arrangement at the moment. It makes sense, not just for Scotland, but the rest of the UK, for that to be maintained. And the European treaties specifically don't allow you to be in Schengen if you're in the CTA. That's the short technical version. I hope it's helpful. Yep, um, just a couple of quick points. Firstly, um, I, I'm neither a unionist nor a British nationalist, so Stuart, don't, don't label me. Um, secondly, if you're going to have a different immigration system as an independent Scotland, if, we're going to, if we were independent and we had a different immigration system, then I suspect it would be England that would be building a border. So how um, on the basis, Ireland? On the, on the, well, Northern Ireland and Ireland have the same, the same approach when it comes to migration. And, that's, and there's a reason for that which you know, but I mean, nevertheless, the idea you'd be an independent country with a different immigration system and there would be no border is an example of one of those unanswered questions that the SNP just um, seek to ignore. And this idea that Stuart, you get the same sense of solidarity as I have, I mean, it's a bizarre, it's a bizarre claim on the basis that you express your solidarity with working class people in, in England by separating from them. I mean, no trade union was ever formed on the basis of separation. No sense of social solidarity was, it was born of a sense of let's break away. It was about um, being stronger together and weaker apart. And then on Europe, look, I was the, and don't throw things at me for saying this, but I was the Europe minister in the last Labour government that introduced the Lisbon Treaty. So I had reason to follow the detail of it. Um, uh, a lot of the detail of it. <laughs> and I knew I knew too much about it when a gentleman by the name of Bill Cash, when I was, I was politely able to say to him, 
he misunderstood the relationship between the Lisbon Treaty and the Treaty of Utrecht. Um, and that's the point where I realized I had to get out more. <laughs> um, but the truth is, if you're a new member state, um, you join the European Union as it exists today, which means you sign up to the things that are called the Aki, um, which is um, the policies on the Euro, on migration, and much else besides. Now, this is, not, this is an example where, it's not for me, and they wouldn't take the advice, but if I was, if I was a nationalist, my, my sense would be, you tell people just to just be open about it and say, look, there are, probably, there are probably things that you don't like about becoming independent, but on balance, we think it's a good deal. So, for example, shipyards in Glasgow. Stuart talked about um, the industrial uh, um, power of Scotland. The only thing, meaning, the, the most meaningful thing they build is the Royal Navy, frigates. Right. If Scotland leaves the UK, we leave the Royal Navy. Right. There won't be Royal Navy orders in the Clyde um, in a separate country. And, the, and rather than just saying, oh, no, that's scaremongering, oh, that's not true, of course they will. The SNP should probably say, yeah, you're right, but we'll do something different. But it's part of the, you can have all change that you like, and none of the change that you fear. And I think come the night before the vote, undecided voters will say, nah. You're, 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 I think you're, we moved off yeah. the question. But yeah, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> Those, okay, this, this I'll stop. The red jump yeah. has been very patient. <laughs> um, we are about to stop, so just, uh, has anybody else got something very pressing that they want to ask? Is that just the one, Jim? I need to put my glasses on. <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name's Dan Hall. I'm a student here. Um, Mr. Murphy, I was just listening to your original argument, and there was quite a lot of emphasis about you know, political clout and how the UK is stronger together in that way. But I found some of Mr. Hosey's economic points quite interesting and compelling, and there weren't many sort of economic arguments that you made. I was just wondering if you could describe, I mean, firstly, do you think Scottish people would be better economically in a union, and, and secondly, well, well how, how is that the case, and what do you have to say to what Mr. Hosey said in the economic sense? Will we take, um, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, for Jim Murphy. Um, Just answer the question. How do you uh, propose in your new devolution plans to address the West Lothian question, mm -hmm. which is something that you, at the right at the beginning, you said the toughest question to ask a politician is how do you do it? So please tell us how. And uh, secondly, everybody seems to be so eager to talk about deprivation in Scotland and, uh, and working class conditions. I'm a working class guy. I, was, I, I, didn't come, I didn't grow up in a deprived background. And if it is so deprived, what have the Labour Party done about it for the last 60 years? Okay. Well, Jim. Okay, well, historical, what's the Labour Party done? Um, cr create the National Health Service over time. The national, but you said, what's it, what's it done over all those years? In more recent times, the national minimum wage, in more recent times, tax credits, um, sure start centres, and so much else besides. But I'm not here to, I mean, you ask me the question, I can go through a long list, it'd be really boring. It's important but boring for me to read out a list to you. Um, on uh, the point about how would that work, I think we've got, we have an, we have an imperfect unwritten constitution. I would rather we had a precise written constitution. Um, but part of the perfect unwritten constitution is it's evolved over time. Uh, and so there's all sorts of issues, right? We're not, we've, got no, we're not, we've got no plans to change the way in which MPs vote in the House of Commons. But for example, many of you will be Londoners. That, on you, that um, colourful character of a mayor that you have, um, responsible, the Assembly's responsible for transport policy in London. Probably, probably sensibly, um, but London MPs still vote on transport policy um, for the rest of England. So if we're going to get to a point where you some, some people say Scots can't vote on this or that and the other, it's a logic. There would be an argument about other people, London MPs, not voting on Liverpool's transport system. But then there's an argument. Um, well, there's all sorts of argument about Liverpool's transport system, which I won't go into. That'd be another debate. Um, on the point. Um, on this, this other point about um, economics, right? Scotland spends £1,200 a year 
per person more on public services <coughs> than, the, than the UK average, £1,200. Now, th that's, it's not that we're, ha we're, we're taxed higher, um, but it gets £1,200 per person more back in terms of public spending. And you make your own judgment as to the oil revenue as part of a bigger UK economy is significant. But oil revenue in a smaller independent country would have an even greater proportion um, of government revenue. And for that, for an independent Scotland to base so much of its economic analysis on the fluctuating nature of an oil price, which we've seen just over the past couple of days with what's happening in Ukraine, the way in which oil prices have fluctuated. As well, the experts today have said, and I'm not going to read it out, it's here, the report has really, uh, said that the SNP have been overly optimistic in the way in which they've assessed oil and gas revenues. There's the other point, where Stuart quite f fairly made his argument, which I think, Stuart, your argument was that Scotland has 9.9% .9 of the population gets 9.3%. Fair point four, 9.99. Yeah. Now, that, those figures, you're not comparing like with like. Scotland puts in 56 billion and gets back 64. Yeah. It's the way in which these, these figures divide up. So there is a very strong economic argument. Um, and I think that will be a huge part of the context for a lot of these undecided voters. Because if you generate an economy, it's about how you then divide that up fairly amongst and give everyone a fair share of that opportunity. And it'll be a big thing amongst these undecided voters. In West Lothian question. It's West Lothian question. Independence is the answer to it, self-evidently. Well, it's certainly answered lots that's, of problems. That's very good of you, Jim. <laughs> because, uh, because it gives uh, the Scottish Government the tools and levers to do things. The Jim made a whole number of points here that were fascinating. He made the point about the deficit, which I made fairly, 8.4% of the population, 9.9% .9 of the tax, 9.3% of the expenditure. I did say there was a deficit, but it was lower than the UK's. And the argument appears to be staying within this 1.5 trillion indebted UK is risk-free, but having a Scotland with a lower deficit and starting with a lower debt is somehow risky. That's just illogical. As is this wonderful argument that uniquely for Scotland, oil is a problem. Because that's a, I'm paraphrasing. Oil is a problem, but only for Scotland. And then, of course, the pretense that we base everything on oil. I said in my speech at the beginning it was important, but it was a smaller share of GDP than Norway's economy. And given that our non-oil GDP output is almost exactly the same as the UK's, yes, it's useful, yes, we want it, yes, we'll ha harness it, yes, we'll set up an oil fund, so let's not pretend oil somehow uniquely uh, is a, a problem. Um, the final point Jim made, and it was alluded to earlier, <coughs> about the Barnett formula and about the spending per head, uh, and it's true. The spending per head is higher, that is a matter of fact. But isn't it odd? They only ever want to talk about the expenditure side of the balance sheet, never the income side of the balance sheet. So in year after year, when we've generated surpluses for the UK, and it's all been siphoned off to the London Treasury, not a whisper about where Scotland's income went but always a scare story about how much you're going to lose because we get more spent on us. We get more spent on us, friends, because we generate more in tax and have done, and I'll end the way I started, we have done for over 32 years. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I think probably what you get a taste of is uh, this is uh, a, an historic time, and it is about two futures for Scotland. One is a vote for independence, and the other is a change. No one's voting for the status quo, and in a few weeks we will hear what one party's got to say about that. We disagree on many, many things, but what Scots all dis uh, agree on is we all like a wee swally. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I think we'll um, retire for yeah, a drink. Sure. Thank you very, very much. I do the Sorry. <laughs> No need. <laughs> Someone in the front is saying, can we have a show of hands to see if anybody has changed their mind? So, a vote. <laughs> that would be a front page story. Yeah. Has, does, 
Can I see a show of hands for those of you that think Scotland should vote yes for independence? Well, it does seem a few more, I would say. <laughs> you haven't got your glasses on. Oh, yeah. um, and those of the, you that think Scotland should vote no and stay within the UK, still an overwhelming majority, I would say. They don't have a vote. Thank you. <laughs> they don't have a vote. <laughs>